And thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it's with a heavy heart that I rise to uh, also make a uh, contribution to this condolence motion marking the passing of an extraordinary woman, um, Dr Loacher O'Donoghue. And I add my voice to the outpouring of, um, of grief and, uh, and beautiful tributes uh, to Dr Loacher O'Donoghue, AC, CBE, DSG, a trailblazing Aboriginal leader who, on Ghana, who died on Ghana country, surrounded by her loved ones not so long ago. And uh, I think all of those letters those distinguished letters at the end of Dr O'Donoghue's um, title give you some insight to just how profoundly influential she was, not just in uh, First Nations communities in Australia, but how indebted um, our nation, uh, and indeed she had an impact on an international scale as well, but how indebted Australia is to her leadership. Her passing will be felt uh, right across Australia. And um, Loacher lived an extraordinary life. And I spoke recently about her courage, her leadership and her determination when I um, rose in this house to speak on the National Apology to the Stolen Generations, that anniversary, that important anniversary we just had. Dr O'Donoghue was born near um, Indulkana in the far north of South Australia in 1932. And Loach's mother, Lily, was a Yankanjara woman and her father, Tom O'Donoghue, was first-generation Irish-Australian. Uh, the Coniston Massacre, which was the last uh, documented massacre of First Nations people in Australia, had occurred in the Northern Territory just a few years earlier. That's the historical context of uh, her life. At age two, she was taken from her mother and placed in a mission home in South Australia, like so many other First Nations people of her time. Her name was anglicised. She was prohibited from speaking her own language. And along with her name and language, her family and her identity were stolen from her. In the mission, uh, and this was the United Aborigines Mission, a, uh, a group, an order that I'm very familiar uh, with through my own work in Fitzroy Crossing many years ago. It was the UAM that also um, uh, missionised and worked in the Kimberley region. But uh, for Loacher, um, this mission was a very harsh experience. It was a very harsh disciplinary regime uh, without love and frequent incidents of abuse. And I don't think we should ever uh, sugarcoat that or gloss over that. Um, she witnessed uh, so many accounts of abuse that, of course, many, many decades later, we would finally called to account through the Royal Commission into um, the institution, like uh, child sexual abuse in institutions in Australia, the very institutions, many of which were faith-based religious organisations. Uh, they were the very institutions that people were asked to um, instill, you know, to trust. That trust was profoundly betrayed. We know that now through the many volumes uh, that the Royal Commission has uh, has left. So it was a uh, it was a pretty traumatic life for her, and uh, and of course her family and all of those kinship networks that are impacted when kids are ripped forcibly removed from uh, families. She was like so many without a birth certificate. Um, without uh, the white missionaries gave her the birth date of the 1st of August. And, of course, we know that as the horse's birthday in Australia. And uh, I know as a young anthropologist working through many of the uh, historical records that were held with the, child, uh, with the Aboriginal protection agencies across Australia, like literally 
thousands of Aboriginal kids were given this birth date of the 1st of August because, you know, they didn't have a birth certificate and that was as uh, far as our imagination was able to stretch in those days, it would seem. Um, a pretty heartbreaking thing for a lot of Aboriginal people to kind of find out later on in life why their birthday was the 1st of August. Um, so even, you know, even her birthday was stolen from her. And at age 16, Loitcher was sent to Victor Harbour as a servant for a very large family, a job which she did for two years until she fought ferociously to become a nurse. And uh, when the matron at the Royal Adelaide Hospital refused uh, her because she was Aboriginal, she took her battle to the State Premier and anyone else in government who would listen to her case. Uh, and, you know, gosh, how thankful are we for her determination and tenacity today. She went on to become the first Aboriginal nurse in Australia. She said in 1994, I resolved that one of the fights was to actually open the door for Aboriginal women to take up the nursing profession and for also uh, for the young men to get into apprenticeships. These were two really, really stark um, barriers of um, discrimination that she had experienced and uh, she was determined to rip those barriers uh, away and uh, she really, that was for her the impetus uh, of a lifelong dedication to activism and um, calling out, not just calling out discrimination, but doing the really hard work of, um, of reform. And for that, uh, we are, you know, deeply, deeply indebted to uh, Loretta O'Donoghue. She went out um, to gather, when she left us, she had a very, very long list of amazing achievements and outstanding accomplishments. And I'm gonna just go through just some of those. Um, she was Australian of the Year in 1984 in recognition of her work and her personal contribution to uh, bridging the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. She was named a National Living Treasure in 1998 and awarded a Companion um, of the Order of Australia, that, that's the AO component of her title, uh, the following year. She was also made an Honorary Fellow of the Royal Australian College of Physicians in 1998 and the Royal College of Nursing. That was, I'm sure, a really proud moment for a woman who had originally been refused entry. She holds multiple honorary doctorates and fellowships and was patron of the Lowitcher Institute, which of course will continue to do extraordinary uh, work uh, to ensure her legacy uh, continues. And in 1990, she became the founding chairperson of ATSIC, uh, which was an extremely memorable uh, moment. She have, uh, had indeed been very instrumental in the establishment of ATSIC and the negotiations around that and then um, did our nation the great service of becoming the inaugural chair person of, uh, of ATSIC. Noel Pearson um, reflected on those times and, and wrote um, about those years as he said, these were ATSIC's best years. They were the years of great coherence in Indigenous affairs. Um, and I think he is absolutely spot on there. Uh, she was, she had an extraordinary capacity to bring people um, both within the First Nations communities across Australia with the vastly different experience of colonisation where that occurs across in different states and territories, um, <coughs> different, um, you, you know, lots of um, common uh, aims and objectives, of course, but she was able to navigate all of those um, meaningful uh, differences that do exist. And she was likewise able to traverse um, all of those complex pathways through government, bureaucracy and, uh, and the broader national population that she was able to speak to with great 
um, meaning and um, and gravitas. People listened when Lois O'Donoghue spoke. People listened. She, um, uh, Noel Pearson also had reflected that without Lowitch's at sick, we would never have defended Eddie Marbo's great legacy and negotiated the Native Title Act and the Indigenous Land Fund. And they are two profoundly um, important pieces of um, important legacies that she has left. And let's not forget also the critical role that she played in the national um, apology to the Stolen Generations. Um, I think one of the comments on her passing from the uh, former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, um, was to say that she um, had uh, obviously been knocking on the doors and uh, trying to advise about the importance of having a national apology to the Stolen Generations, um, but she went straight to um, uh, Kevin Rudd upon his election and said, it's time, this is your moment, this is your time to do this now. And uh, that was one of the nation's most significant truth-telling events. Um, she was able, as she always does, uh, she transcended her, her own experiences through life, all of those hardships, all of her own and her family's uh, pain and grief. Um, she rose above all of that and uh, reached out and could see the significance of an apology to this nation. It was something that she saw as embracing both um, our opportunity to face squarely to a really traumatic part of our nation's history, but the only way that we could all um, heal and move forward was to confront that history face on and uh, have the apology. And there was lots of resistance at the time, lots of people who thought that this was, you know, an opening of the door to all sorts of litigation, all kinds of, um, uh, you know, negative impacts. But she was able to prosecute, and I think history shows very successfully that that, that was indeed the wrong way to look at this and that this was a moment for our history to engage in some serious truth-telling. And that is confronting and that is uncomfortable sometimes, but you come through that with a... Um, with a renewed sense of hope and possibilities uh, for uh, just relationships going forward. And sadly, Loacher uh, didn't get to see a national voice to parliament, which I know she would have uh, liked to have seen established, but um, or her people formally recognised in the constitution. But... Um, I suspect if she was with us now, she would uh, be advising us all not to ever, um, it was not in her nature to just um, uh, give up on fighting for justice and it might take different forms and take different directions and we were yet to see what, what happens um, for us as a nation there, how we grapple with the ongoing nature of our relationship with First Nations people and uh, what that just relationship is going to look like going forward. Loacher O'Donoghue didn't get to re be reunited with her mother um, until she was more than 30 years of age. And following a, a trip to Cooper Pedy um, with the South Australia's uh, then Department of Aboriginal Affairs and her biographer, Stuart Rintoll, describes how not long after she arrived in Cooper Pedy, uh, Loacha heard a group of people sitting outside a store looking at her and saying, that's Lily's daughter. And from then she learned that her birth name was Loacha uh, and that her mother was a heartbroken woman living in poverty in Unandatta. In the weeks that followed, uh, Lily waited for her daughter in the outback town of Unandatta, staring off into the desert. And that reunion... It was not easy. Um, there was tension. There was a language barrier. They couldn't talk to each other. And uh, I remember an ex-Lowitcher explaining in a 
one of her reconciliation lectures, if I'm not mistaken, that um, the only language she had was to look into her mother's eyes and what she saw was a woman broken by grief. And um, that was a very hard thing for both of them to, to reconcile. But um, Rin Toll, uh, her biographer later writes that um, Loacher would later talk of that reunion as a lesson in the limitlessness of hope and the strength of patience. Wow, I cannot, um, I would hope that I would have capacity to be um, that sort of generous in my self-reflection had that, had I been walking in the shoes of either Loacher O'Donoghue or her mother, Lily, at that time. When, when Rintoll asked Loacher why she'd lived the life she had, she simply replied, because I love my people. Thank you, Loacher, for your love, your humour, your strength, your determination, your perseverance and that limitlessness of hope and strength of patience that you lived every day, for your teaching um, so many others to follow in your footsteps and for giving your country everything you had, uh, your legacy is immense. You are forever, we are forever in your debt and our hearts are at half mast today, but it is your time to rest now. You've done everything you can um, and I guess the, uh, the rest is for those of us who follow to ensure that your legacy continues to grow and lives on. Bale Loacher O'Donoghue.